Good evening. All right, welcome, bienvenidos. I'm glad you're all at Cafe College. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, uh, this is your new home, I hope. Come and visit us anytime. My name is Rebecca Gonzalez. I'm the program manager here at Cafe College, which means I'm in charge of a lot of stuff, uh, scheduling, programming, and also inviting people like y'all to come out in and, and enjoy our facilities. Uh, just to give you some stats, for those of you who are not aware, the uh, Cafe College is actually managed by the San Antonio Education Partnership, which has been around since 1988, doing this type of work in San Antonio and the community. Um, since we opened in 2010, we have serviced approximately 24,000 students. That's unduplicated, so we're really proud of the work that we're doing. We're, we're trying to make a difference here in the San Antonio community. And like I said, we invite you to come and visit the center to use it with your students, but also to use it as a meeting space just like this. And I hope that today's conversation is productive. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Brenda Burton Mitchell, and I am the director for the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the U.S. Department of Education. And we are thrilled to be in San Antonio and asking for your help as we try to deepen our work around family and community engagement under the banner of Together for Tomorrow. I have with me two members of our team, Michael Robbins, who many of you already know, and Reverend Dr. Ken Bedell is trying to hide back there in the back. <laughs> and so uh, we've been here now for two days. We'll be here uh, tomorrow as well. And we're very appreciative of the opportunity to participate in some parts of the Kellogg Foundation's uh, effort this week, where they are also talking about their work to deepen and strengthen family engagement. And so we know that there, everyone in the community is an important part of this. We know that children's first teachers are really their family, their parents, the people that they live with, whether they're their biological parents or the caring adults that surround them. And we know that in this room, some of you are going to have to raise your hand five or six times, but we have uh, critical parts of the community represented in this room tonight. And if we had to put a face on community engagement, on family and community engagement, this room, I think, would represent what that kind of has to look like. Now, I don't know, you know, every once in a while I do things, I have no explanation for why I'm doing it. So I'm getting ready to do something that I have no explanation for. Does anybody even have a birthday today? Is it anybody's birthday? Okay, well this is everybody's birthday. <laughs> because we're being born together into a new relationship as those who are committed to making sure that this world doesn't die, but lives and thrives. How many of you are parents of students in the San Antonio or parts of Texas? How many of you are parents in this area? Woo! <laughs> Any of our, our school leaders, principals, administrators, and teachers? Superintendent, that sounds good. Board members. <laughs> Board members. Now see, now, okay, here's a lesson. School leaders. Now let me ask that question again. How many school leaders are in the room? Now the next time I ask that question, everybody in here who cares about what's happening in our schools. How many school leaders are in this room? Oh, that's what I'm talking about. To find new ways to look at ourselves as we learn to work together to make sure we're creating a climate that says we're all invested in making sure that every child, every family has access to high quality education from cradle to career college. And so as we go around the country in these listening sessions, we're really just trying to figure out what's already being done that's effective that could be replicated. What can we learn as the federal government that we can use our little blueprint, if you will, to just share in other places? What have parents experienced and learned that you wish we would listen to? And maybe nobody's ever asked. So we're, we're going to be asking those questions because we cannot grow and sustain this for to be your partners if your voices are not the voices that are driving us to try to make things better across the nation. We have some uh, uh, great news when we talk about, and we are Obama appointees, and so although this isn't a political meeting, it's important for you to know that one of the reasons we talk so much about what the president has said and wants to do is because we represent him and we're on the road. And, and, and he has said, well, we've got to do something about the drop-off rate. But we are glad to report 
that even though there's still too many dropouts, we have fewer and young people dropping out of our school. The message is getting there that you've got to provide a way for your own future, and education is still the key to that. We have more and more young people now who understand about the Pell Grants and that they're eligible and they're getting help with FAFSA so that they can apply. And I see some heads nodding, so I've let some of you have helped people fill out those applications so that they don't miss opportunities that are there. But sometimes just a lack of awareness uh, contributes to them not being able to be engaged. We are moving <coughs> beyond No Child Left Behind. Most of us recognize that there were some bad things about it, but there were some good things. Because some of us would have never probably stopped to evaluate how do you hold people accountable if they don't know what the standards are. Now, granted, we, we try to make lots of changes. Uh, we're at a stalemate on getting legislation passed, but Arnie Duncan and President Obama said, you know, we can't wait for certain things. And so that's why the ESEA flex has been made available, and many states have taken advantage of that so that they can be innovative and creative and still move forward on improving outcomes for children in our educational system. And so for us, this is a really, really exciting time. And we're in a rare position in the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships of doing the inside-outside work. We get to break down silos inside the department. We get to go out to the community and hear what you say that gives us strength to go back and, and work for those things that will help us achieve our shared goals for all of our children. And that's why it's so easy to use this thing. We're trying to work together for tomorrow so that all of our children have the best opportunity. All of our families have the best opportunities. And one of the learnings, the early learnings, is that in many cases, the families have not felt welcome or invited into this space of education. It, it varies school by school. Mm -hmm. But what if we could come up with a united voice that maybe just naturally is leading to say, yes, these are our schools. And our means everybody represented in this group. So faces we may never see. But if the message is out there, everybody will see that our nation is about creating or recreating the culture of academic success and, and excellence for everyone. And so tonight we're gonna to spend some time hearing about some of the things that you are doing, some of your dreams, some of your challenges to us, and invite you to see us as partners in this work going forward. So we are really, really excited to announce a, a new partnership we have a memorandum of understanding with the National Center for Family Literacy that just gives me goosebumps because it's an opportunity for us to, to have somebody working right with us and somebody that we can work right with. 22 years of experience in doing this work, evidence-based practices, examples of success that there ought to be on the front page of every newspaper in the nation. And so I am thrilled uh, now to introduce Emily Kirkpatrick, who will share with us and introduce her president. Um, they take a great leadership in this world, and uh, we're going to get sick of seeing each other, but we're going to get so much stuff together. But it's going to be a good sickness. This is happy sickness because we know that if we're not united in our efforts, uh, we will not be as successful as we can be. And all of you are probably doing things that have measures of success, but when we intentionally come together to do it, wow. Watch out world. So as we begin to change the world together, I invite you to uh, offer some remarks in the and we're so grateful for the opportunity to partner with you on this. Would you all just celebrate them a little bit? <laughs> here to learn from and to hear from the parents in this room and that's what Greg Sheeran and I think the, the greatest joy so on behalf of NCFL thank you for having us after we leave here today full of your ideas and input we encourage you to look at our websites for free tools and tips on books to read with your children things to do to prepare your entire family for college um, or to subscribe to our Wonder of the Day, something free of charge to read with your children and, and children that you love every single day. So take a look at famlet.org and wonderopolis.org. Sharon, anything you'd like to say? It's just great to be here. I'm Sharon Darling with the National Center for Family Literacy, and I can't tell you how excited I am about what's going on at the Department of Education. I mean, 
I'm old, as you can tell, and I've been through a lot of administrations and lots of Department of Education changes, but I've never seen such a passion and commitment to parent engagement as I've seen, I've seen in this administration with this Department of Education, and particularly with your leadership, uh, Brenda, it's just, and, and Michael. They are very interested in hearing from you, not just being here because this is the right thing to do. They want to know what it is that the department should be doing in parent engagement and what's working across the country. And so I'm just so impressed and so excited to be a partner with them in this effort. So um, my congratulations to you because this is this is substantive. This is digging deep. This is deep work, not just this is the right thing to say or the right thing to do. So thank you for your commitment to this. Thank you. And I, I would say, as I said to Michael, sometimes we're so anxious to get into the program part that little vignettes that might help you understand where that drive comes from. I, I taught elementary school for almost 10 years. I was the president of the teachers union. I was one of those teachers that sometimes, you know, the principal wasn't sure what, what he was going to do with me. I had a room full of parents. I had room, mothers, grandmothers, uncles, cousins. There was never a day that there wasn't an adult in my room uh, just because I just thought that's what I was supposed to do. I taught first, second, third grade. My last years in the classroom, I had four, fifth, sixth grade split, 39 kids, 36 boys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I hadn't had those adults, from the community who were in my room with me, who traded times coming in so that I could pay attention to individual kids. I had other teachers who said, Brenda, you're gonna have to do 29 preparations. And so we started, without anybody's permission, we started passing classes. So if somebody was teaching science and somebody was teaching social studies, if I was you know, we just teamed up with each other. And at the end of the school year, we got an award for being innovative. We were surviving. We didn't know any other way to teach. But it, it, it benefited the community. Parents weren't afraid to come into school. They were upset if they didn't get to come. And so now, all of these decades later, to see this as a challenge, so I said, no, I know this is doable. Because we did it when we didn't have the kind of pressures that we have on us now. And so that's part of what drives me, because I've seen it work. I benefited from it. I think I was a better teacher as a result of having other people in my room every day. And being able to model what we wanted other families to do because our school, our classroom was a family. And so uh, this is real for us. And we hope that you will make it personal. And, and when you make it personal, then you can you know, take even some of the shots that may come at you for doing that but you know that you're doing it because it's going to make a difference in your lives and the lives of those who uh, are around you. Michael Robbins is a real trooper on this. He is giving leadership from our office to make sure we shape the, the tour that we're taking. Uh, he takes a lot of blows on the inside, but I try to give him his kudos because <laughs> in spite of it, he, he's on it, he understands the policy side, and he's done this work at, at various levels, having done. Uh, been involved in the seed schools and we <laughs> drive through Washington. Anybody who's been to Washington, D.C.? Okay. We drive through Washington in some of the worst neighborhoods and Michael said, oh, I used to work up there. Oh, I used to do this in this laundromat. I used to pass out flyers. And so he's really a connected person and has a heart for working with uh, partners all across this nation. So I want you to uh, welcome Michael. He's going to lead us through the next part of our program tonight. I do want to mention, in case you haven't noticed, that you are on television tonight. This is being live streamed uh, and will be archived on the web. So, uh, and uh, and so, uh, so when you speak, you know you can smile into the camera, or, but do do try to, to speak up. And we're going to be hearing from all of you. Um, secondly, um, you know I want to thank uh, the United Way. Uh, for uh, the food and also for uh, providing uh, simultaneous translation for some folks uh, that have requested it. And so do understand that that's also going on. Uh, and take a breath every now and then, right? Right, Eddie? 
that he talks very quickly, so we're going to make her slow. Down. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to frame our conversation the way that we've been thinking about family engagement at the department, uh, and then we'll hear from Hetty, uh, who, who will dig in specifically on this issue of attendance and family engagement. We're going to do an interactive activity with Hetty. And then we're going to be hearing from all of you. Um, a few of you I've talked to before and you're ready to speak. Many of you I'm going to sneak up on and you'll be speaking anyway. Um, so uh, as you think about what it is that you do, we really are looking at this uh, in three areas. And under Together for Tomorrow, we are not separating community and family engagement. We strongly believe that these need to be addressed together and that they, they uh, accommodate a similar approach and a similar shift where education needs to be seen as everyone's responsibility. And we need better answers to the question, how do I help? And that's going to require a shift in the way that we're working. Too often, uh, you know, it's, uh, any of you, if any of you had an elementary school student, you get the report card. Too often schools, if they got one of those elementary school report cards, they would get an unsatisfactory and plays well with others, right? So we need, we need to change that. Too often on the community side, you have a partnership that starts with someone who says, well, I got money from a foundation uh, to give 20 of your students dance lessons. Can I get to 20 of your students after school? And so we have this mismatch. And so part of what we're talking about is how do we align needs and resources and really have a better magic conversation between schools and families and communities. To what end? To, to focus specifically on two things, student engagement and academic achievement. So as we look at three, we look at three areas here, and this is the three areas I'd like you to think about the work that you're doing already. We're here in San Antonio because there is a lot of great work doing already that we want to spotlight for the nation. So the first circle is laying the groundwork. The second circle is really making it happen. And the third circle is celebrating and inspiring. So on this first circle, laying the groundwork, what are the systems that need, need to be in place? What are the values that need to shift? What are the relationships that need to be built? Who are the people that need to be in place? The capacity piece to make this work. Uh, and secondly, on the making it happen piece, we're focused on what we call the ABCs. We've adapted this. Uh, for us, the ABCs is attendance, behavior, course performance, and college access. And so how can partnerships with families be focused on these outcomes that we know that are important for students and are important for schools and are measurable on a regular basis? It's not a standardized test score that you get months from now that you can look back on and maybe or maybe not act on. You know whether or not a child's at school today. You know whether or not they've missed 10% of school so far that year, placing them in this chronic absence uh, category. So ABCs. And then lastly, this celebrating and inspiring piece, it's the piece that too often gets left out. Uh, we're very quick to talk about all the challenges that we face in education, uh, but need to be more focused on celebrating our successes we did a town hall last summer in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, the Las Vegas mayor, any of you know Carolyn Goodman, the mayor of Las Vegas, have got to meet her. She is, uh, she is what you might expect from the mayor of Las Vegas. She is uh, blonde hair, bejeweled. Uh, she came in in a whirlwind. I talked to her a couple times on the phone. And she comes to me and, and introduces herself in person. She says, I'm sorry, I, I have to calm down. I was just at this meeting of wedding planners. And we were talking about all these exciting out-of-the-box things we could do with wedding planning in Las Vegas. And now we're talking about something very serious, education. I just have to tone it down. And I, I told her, I said, you know, if we could take this same energy that you had in that room that you just left and put it to what it is we're trying to do here, we're going to be a lot farther along to trying to get this work done. So let's think about the best parties. Think about the best celebrations. Think about the best recognitions that you have ever been a part of. And then let's weave that into our work on family and community engagement. So thinking about those three areas. I'm going to turn now to Hetty Chang. Uh, we uh, were able to recognize Hetty uh, at the White House uh, recently uh, as one of our uh, champions of change uh, in education uh, for her work, uh, particularly uh, with African-American communities. 
Uh, her work on attendance uh, is a key piece of this ABCs, and uh, she has uh, some exciting news to share with us. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, San Antonio, for inviting me here. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually have been with the Kellogg ga Gathering and had a wonderful chance to see Avance this morning. What an inspire, inspiring local homegrown story of success. Um, IDRA was also um, being uh, one of the site visits, and so it's such a pleasure because I know what incredible work you have going on. We had the privilege of hearing from your mayor yesterday and his vision for a much better world for all our kids. So um, I'm actually going to talk, um, as, you, as um, Michael mentioned, uh, these ABCs, attendance, behavior, course failure, and I also see City Year in the room, so this is near and dear to you all in San, uh, in, in San Antonio. But this issue of attendance is actually one of those measures that you can actually bring down to the very early ages to use as a sign of whether kids are on the path for reading at grade level uh, by the end of third grade, because if you don't get there by the end of third grade, it gets pretty tough in fourth grade when they expect that you're gonna be able to read to learn all your subjects. And by the time kids are in middle and high school, um, attendance along with behavior and course failure become key warning signs for dropout. But I want to do a little exercise, and I know we're on camera, but I need three of you to volunteer to help me out. And you're going to come into this middle section here. So I'm going to beg, cajole, plead something, <laughs> that three of you will stand up. I promise I won't bite. Uh, and I just need three of you to stand here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> but you all get the point, and what you're now seeing is a difference in third grade reading. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> research part is that if no matter how good your instruction is in class it doesn't make that much of a difference if the kids aren't there in class to benefit from it right so if you all are for example going to invest in preschool for all in San Antonio make sure that you've invested this and that kids benefit from it and you're using this to build a habit of attendance that will help kids do well in school in the workplace one of the things I think we have to shift is we think about attendance in the wrong way. We think about attendance as compliance. It's about our compulsory ed laws. You didn't attend school, so I'm gonna threaten you with the law and you were somehow bad because you didn't attend school. Or we, and Cal, I live in California, like here, we think about attendance as we're filling out these sheets because we need it for our funding, right? And this is what keeps school funding. Now, while that may be true, the most important thing about attendance is that when kids are absent, it's a lost opportunity to learn while a child is in the classroom. And the truth is, is that if a kid misses too much school, which is what we have for research, 18 days or more over the course of a year, for any reason, it can even be excused reasons, it can be for things that we understand why kids would miss, it's very hard to catch up if you have two years across of missing school in pre-K and K, your chances of reading in third grade are very slim. It gets, and by the time as kids get older, it can be a sign of disengagement. Now what we do know is that there are at least three kinds of reasons why kids miss school. One is actually, we're all affected by myth. As parents, as community members, even educators sometimes, we don't realize that absences add up. We think it's all about unexcused absences when it's not just that. It's absences add up, and if too many occur, you're gonna fall behind, and you know what? This isn't just a middle and high school issue. This is starting as early as pre-K and K. Or we think it's all consecutive absences, not the kid who misses once every two weeks, which is also a problem. The other issue is that sometimes when absences are happening, it's because there are barriers. You can't get health care. You can't get access to transportation to school. You've got too much community violence. And when that happens, we gotta look at all those absences adding up and find out what are those barriers and as parent, find out from parents and kids what's getting in the way of them getting to school. And then sometimes I also wanna put out there, absences are about aversion. They are sometimes because the school program is not working for those kids, it's not engaging. And then we have to figure out whether we have teachers who really need professional development or support or sometimes in the hazy area with young kids, it's when kids are anxious and we don't have a way to transition them to school and they're saying every day, what happens when kids are nervous? You guys know this, mommy, I've got a stomach ache and it comes all out as excused absences. This is where parents can make a huge difference. But we gotta engage in interactive, different kinds of activities that help parents both see the role that they can play by monitoring their kids' data, by looking at data for schools, by calling for the data, by making sure that schools are aware of the barriers to keep kids from getting to school and advocating for solutions when we need them. And what I'm gonna hand out to you all is we have just um, launched today, sent out, time with this event. Um, there's two things on here. One is actually a parent engagement toolkit with interactive activities that we, this is downloadable for free. And there's also our call, which is trying to get everyone to think about this September as a time for building that culture and awareness of attendance. It's just a start, but it's an easy start. And in San Antonio, I challenge you all to launch September as Attendance Awareness Month. And um, you can find these on our website and please join us. This campaign um, for the Countess campaign is actually with America's Promise Alliance, a campaign for um, grade level reading, civic enterprise, and the points of light. Um, so, Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you today about what will help keep parents engaged in school, and I hope attendance is one of those things that we can provide support to you and also learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for just a couple quick questions, if anyone has a question for Hetty. 
All right, we'll have time for conversation uh, as we move forward. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, this was an opportunity here because of the new framework that's released. You know, I wanted to, to take advantage of Hetty being in town for us to spotlight attendance. Now we're turning to you. This is our opportunity to learn from you. This is your opportunity to learn from each other. We find that so much of what happens when we go places is that we have people who are living in the same communities who may uh, are meeting them, each other for the first time or hearing about things uh, for the first time. Uh, we're here in San Antonio because of the good work that's already happening. Uh, I'd like to turn first to uh, our friends at the United Way. Uh, Katie's, I think, going to, to speak on your behalf. Um, and here, just a, a couple minutes on sort of some of the, the highlights of your work on family partnerships. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Department of Education so much for hosting this really critical conversation. I also want to thank all of our parents here tonight. Um, thank y'all for coming out. We know it's uh, late weeknight, so we appreciate it. Um, I want to thank Presa Community Center, and know Stephanie is here, as well as Family Service Association. Nancy Hart is here, I saw her earlier this year. Um, and they are community partners in this work, and we could not do it without without y'all, so thank you. Um, I also want to thank a couple of our volunteers, Amy Phipps, Peggy Walker, Lady Romano, there's a Barbara Gentry here, and of course we have uh, Becky uh, Robinson from South Sam, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, and we have partnerships with many, many entities here, so uh, we, we really can't do this alone, and I, I want to start off uh, on that foot because this partnership is about truly partnering and, and putting our money where our mouth is. And of course, SAISD, how can I forget Janice Hammond and all of your support um, throughout this work. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the parent engagement work that we've been on for the last seven years. But of course, I also want to hear from parents. Um, so please uh, please talk if, you, if I get something wrong or I, or I misspeak here. The mission of our partnership is to increase academic um, success and overall graduation rate for <coughs> San Antonio youth through parent engagement. And we really do uh, put our money where our mouth is in terms of having this be parent driven. Parents um, have driven every component of this work since inception. Um, they work with us at every level, be it at the budget level overall, at the uh, individual campus budget level, to the leadership development piece, to home visits, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are four main components of our model, and, um, and I'm going to talk sort of broader and then go into some of, of the changes we've seen in SAISD. But the first and most important are these parent-to-parent -parent home visits. So uh, we find that this is really the backbone of our work. This is, these are non-punitive home visits. They, they blanket entire grades, right? So it's a blanket approach. And it's parents reaching out to other parents. There are no staff members, there's not a teacher involved. It's parents reaching out to other parents asking how's it going how are you how's your child doing at school this year that produces a very very different conversation when a lot of folks have experiences with home visits that are not necessarily in a positive light um, so we find that folks are much more willing to open up and the parents end up tracking um, information and data and they share it with the principal and the principal in the school is able to shift and react um, in, a, in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise without this strong and realistic feedback from the community. The other piece of this partnership that's super critical is a parent room. This is a space that is on campus. It's a classroom sized space um, that the parents manage in partnership with the principals and of course the partner agencies, Family Service Association and Crescent Community Center has support. But this becomes a bridge between the neighborhood community and the school community. And um, it really is a great segue to bring parents in, make them feel comfortable on campus. Again, the parents drive it, so they make it purposely warm. They decorate it in the rooms. We have uniforms, we have emergency food, we have um, translation <coughs> systems that y'all can hear right now. We have resources across the community that the parents have vetted, so they're not going to refer someone to a, a resource that they don't uh, know works. We also have leadership development. So again, when, when this first started, um, having a space at the table for parents is critical. Uh, but the parents told us, you know, we want to be here, but we need a couple of tools to be fully present at this table. And so the parents work with our volunteers um, very closely to develop plans each year around leadership development. And they change annually because we know that nothing is stagnant in life or in education. So we are able to react and respond to those needs as, as they happen. And then as we were discussing earlier, celebration. Celebration is a big piece of this work. And, and I agree, you know, we, get, we do have, we're quick to jump to tough issues, uh, not so much to the good things. And so celebrations is a key um, component of this work, celebrating campus-wide and student <coughs> success. Um, 
parents put on events that have hundreds of people in attendance that the principal can't get folks in the door, but the parents have that magic, natural networking available to them, and they make it happen, and they see everyone shaking their heads. Um, so, so, you know, parents as leaders is critical to this work, and again, we could not, this, this partnership would not happen without the support of our partner agencies, PRESA and Family Service. They support the parents as they develop into leaders, but again, the parents drive it wholeheartedly. Um, you know, we, we know that a lot of families that we work with in our schools, they've experienced some long-term stress, and that makes a significant impact um, in, in terms of how comfortable they feel within the school, how much time they have, um, how they see and perceive their own role as a parent. And so when the agencies support our parent leaders to reach out to other parents as role models and as examples, please come in, join us. This is important for you to be here. Again, we see transformation at, at a significant level. Um, it's, it's, truly, it's truly magical to, to see. We've seen a lot of parents you know, we have a couple of recent graduates in the crowd, I won't point you out, but um, a lot of parents return to their own education. Um, and, and that trickle down effect is inevitable uh, in terms of students and, and kids seeing their parents go back to school and value education. Um, and I think some of this partnership has also helped to rebuild people's trust in schools, right? When they see other parents in the schools, they're much more willing and able to come in. Um, and we've seen uh, a systems change, I think at the community level, we have shifted, and I think Family Service and Presa have as well, organizationally, away from doing for and more towards doing with, right? Understanding that if we do for, um, it does not have the same impact as doing with, right? So we've shifted that at a system level. And then the school, the schools have changed significantly. We have principals who meet with parents on a monthly basis, who welcome people in, um, in a way that they hadn't before, um, simply because they hadn't seen the impact that parents driving the work could have on, on invading, inviting other parents in. And then at the family system level, you know, again, as I mentioned, we have countless parents who go on to school themselves, who, um, who get hired because of the leadership development and support from the agencies into full-time professions, and that impact on the family is absolutely incredible. So uh, that's sort of my 30,000 foot snapshot of a very complex system, but I would love to answer any questions y'all may have, and of course, I would love to hear from the parents. Yeah, if there's parents that would like to add to that, um, and then we can come back to general questions when we get to the discussion. I can add a little something to what Kate was saying. Um, I heard that. Um, probably seeing the changes within the schools. Um, I've had the opportunity so far within the last few years to work in three different schools. And I've really seen the transition from the teachers and the administration in working with the parents. It's no longer, oh, here we have parent volunteers. Here, I need you to do this, 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 and this. It's, I have parents here who are, you know, they have ideas, we have ideas. Let's combine these ideas to come up with something that's even better, that's going to benefit our teachers, it's going to be benefit our school, it's going to benefit our students, and it's going to benefit our community. So you see this this whole different level of engagement where it's not the faculty saying, we have this event we want to do, you guys do it. And it's not parents saying, I have this idea, I'm going to do this, I just need your permission for space. It's, I have this idea. Well, you know, from that idea, I have this idea. And then it, it turns, just completely turns into something else that is so much better than the original ideas either part of it. So it's it's really a complete shift in engagement with faculty and staff with parents. Chuck, I'd like to add one other component. I'd look for, let's say, uh, I'm from the parent from a board sense. You know, at our 100 something campuses that we have, uh, one of the things that we definitely focus from the board to our superintendent all the way down to our campuses was the emphasis on how we create family friendly schools. So we do things that most individuals may not be aware of. I mean, even the design of our schools now had that in consideration. Even little things on where, where does everybody park at? You know, instead of having all the superintendent principals right up front, I said, wait a minute, we should allow our family members to be there because those that come forth, it gives them that instant welcome and whatnot. Even how we build our cafeterias where things are located and design our schools, we consider that concept and whatnot. The other thing that, I'm speaking for the other districts also, is we try to open up schools now. I hope everybody's noticed that. I mean, little things, soccer team needs to practice, let's get them in there. Um, 
PTA and others, imagine you have meetings, but other community groups that may want to have meetings as parents want to be involved with trying to set that up too. So that's something that's done a little bit differently. And, and you're with SAI State? No, no, no. I'm Northside Northside. Okay. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, Northside Ice. Northside Ice. Yeah. 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 Northside Begin as a parent. So, um, you know, I, I just I wanted to bring that up because I think it's, it's hugely important to recognize uh, in terms of an economic development model. Yeah, so this is sort of laying the groundwork. There's, um, you know, there's both paid and stipended and volunteer staff in place in the school. There's partner organizations. There's uh, space considerations, uh, you know, whether it's the parking for parents or the way you design the school or making sure that you have a parent resource room. Uh, so that you have an anchor spot for this work to happen. So these are some interesting common things coming out. I'd like to turn for a second. Do we have um, folks here from the uh, COPS Metro program? Yeah. Do you take a uh, couple minutes just to talk top level about your work? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Jorge Mutiel, I'm the lead organizer with Copper Metro Alliance, uh, organization affiliated with the Industrial Earth Foundation. We do community organizing with congregations primarily. We've also worked with uh, teacher unions and some schools in the past. Uh, for a long time in Texas, we did the model we call the Alliance Schools, and in fact, looks a lot like what United Way is doing now engaging parents and, and bringing the model of organizing and congregations as the center of the community to the school. Um, you know, there are, there are few institutions that are considered center of a community, like the congregation or the public school. And in many parts of our city, the congregation is becoming less, sometimes the center of the community, uh, and the school is becoming even more important as, as, that, uh, as that institution. So. Uh, we've been we've been working again with some schools and some congregations that are already engaged with their school. Uh, Reverend Wood is one of them who was working with a neighborhood school. Uh, what we're trying to do is, in, 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 in many ways, begin to change the culture of the school to create a culture of trust. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we have in our schools is that when you look at rankings like what came out this week on, on school, Texas schools, is that there's a lot of finger pointing. There's a lot of blame, well, it's clearly the parents don't care, or you know, the principal is doing that, the teacher is doing this, and so no, what we're trying to figure out is how do we make everybody an equal stakeholder. Um, and, but what we have is a very unequal power relationship between the principal, the teacher, and the parents. So we're trying to figure out how do we uh, change those, those relationships, whether we foster trust. And sometimes that starts by working together on things that don't have anything to do with student achievement. Sometimes you gotta work on things that the parents wanna work on. Uh, when I first got to San Antonio about five years ago, I was working with the school on the south side, and the principal arranged for for me to meet with 20 parents, all moms. So I met with all 20 of them, one by one, and the principal was very excited because he said, you know, really want to get these parents to help me uh, on, on achievement. Nobody, when I asked them what they care about, none of those moms said she wanted to work on math or reading. They were concerned that kids crossing Crowbat Street uh, were in danger of getting run over. Uh, and so the, the, there was no sign saying this, there's a school there, there was, you know, the, the model patrol would constantly get ignored. And so they were more concerned, it's not that they didn't care about school, but when you rank the chance of your kid getting run over, or reading at grade level, <laughs> so that goes to the top. And so we started working on that, we organized those parents and met with the, uh, with their uh, council members, and they put together a plan. And so now you drive down there and you see appropriate signs, 
And, and so now they see the principal and the teachers as partners, and now they can work on the next thing together. Right? And so that's what we're uh, trying to figure out, is how do we bring the model that we've been working for 40 years in San Antonio, which is organizing institutionally from the congregation now to the school experience. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have um, Eddie here from Leadership SAISD. Um, you shared just for a couple minutes on your work. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you for, for bringing us all together. Uh, it's, not, it's not often enough that we do get in the room and, and uh, share ideas and share stories. So thank you very much to the Department of Education. Uh, like Michael said, I'm, I'm the Executive Director of Leadership SAISD. We are an independent nonprofit organization. So we sit independently of uh, the San Antonio Independent School District. Um, our organization essentially is born from a very, very common idea. Every single person, every single member of our community within SAISD wants our district to be as successful as possible. Nobody's gonna argue with that. Same with Northside, same with Northeast. Everybody in San Antonio has a stake in a successful school district. And there are thousands of people across our city, across our district, working toward that end every single day. Teachers, parents, community members, everybody. And there are many more that would like to do that, but perhaps don't know where to plug in, or perhaps are so daunted by the complexity of education in San Antonio or nationally that they don't know where to start. So that's where our organization comes in. The heart of our organization, the heart of our programming, is a six-month course that runs civically-minded community members through the nuts and bolts of a school district. So for example, we started off this year, uh, this is our first cohort, we started off with what education would look like in the 21st century. We had incredible <coughs> partners from a school district, uh, Superintendent uh, Sylvester Pettis came in, Board Chair Ed Garza came in, several members from the nonprofit community came in to give our participants, our, our 35 participants, an idea of what education in the 21st century would look like. Uh, additionally, we've gone through other topics, everything from equity, diversity, and the achievement gap, to school account or school testing, uh, high stakes testing and accountability. We've gone through very dense and complex uh, issues like education law and regulatory bodies. Uh, school finance was our latest. The, the labyrinth of school finance is as our presenters uh, made very clear. And we're gonna wrap up this year with a seminar on community support and engagement so that our participants have an idea of how they can go forth and stay engaged. Uh, ultimately, our, our vision for our vision for San Antonio and SAIC generally is to have a community of shared responsibility uh, made up of empowered folks that really understand where the key levers are within a school district what the limitations are of a school district, uh, where the allies are within a school district, and essentially how we can all work together to get to that point where our district uh, is as successful as possible. So that's sort of the, the overview of our program. Great, thank you. Um, a lot of what we're spending time uh, on now is looking at how digital learning transitions uh, will, can change the way that schools and families and community organizations all work together. Uh, and you know, as we look at uh, digital learning, as we look at blended learning, you know, part of this is expanding this world of anytime, anywhere learning. We know that we have uh, unprecedented investment on the technology side, but we don't yet have the investment on the family supports, the student supports, and the community infra infrastructure side to make these transitions successful. As we look to the range of institutions that uh, you know, can serve as real assets for family engagement, particularly around Anytime Anywhere Learning, uh, our, our arts and cultural institutions, our libraries uh, are real critical partners. Um, do we have folks here from the San Antonio Library or the San Antonio Museum? Could you share with us a little bit about your work you know, with family engagement in education? Sure. Um, privileged to be here, and we've done a lot of great work with Katie and her partners with United Way, and then also with Judy McCormick in 2016, plus council here in San Antonio. And what we work on at the museum is 
similar to some of the concepts that Katie's actually modeled for us. We've copied some of the United Way methodology here. And we have partnered with P16 on the family engagement side to help teach our community that San Antonio can be your classroom. So it's beyond the classroom, you know, it's traditionally defined in a school. And we'd like the museum to be known of as a learning and enjoyable destination in San Antonio for all of our families. So we've built around the school group tour, which many museums do. They bring kids in for a 45 minute or an hour long tour. And what we've done beyond that is we've scheduled these family activities quarterly, approximately, where we invite the entire family of the students that have been coming on school group tours to the museum for a really engaging day. Their teachers are there, their principal's there, oftentimes their superintendents is there with a special welcome as well. We're all there, um, our staff and volunteers too. And so it's a way to let the families know that the museum's a resource for their family, it's accessible, um, it's welcoming, and most of these are first time visitors and the feedback that we've been getting as they leave has been tremendous. So they're, they're leaving with those messages. The museum is a partner for them in education. It's free, it's accessible, it's welcoming, and, um, and wants to be you know, just a partner in their family's education. So it's been a great way to build on the school group tours by engaging the entire family um, in trying to create a culture of museum going. Great, fantastic. I know we also have some folks from uh, the private sector here, from businesses engaged in this work. Is there anyone uh, from that sector that would like to share some of the work that you're doing related to family engagement and education? If you're hiding, we will find you. <laughs> uh, we have a number of folks uh, from school boards here, from school district administration. Um, I'm interested on a couple things. First of all, you know, are there things, uh, commonalities in what you're doing in your own districts from what you've heard? Can you talk about sort of what's resonated and then what are the what are the things that you'd like to, sh to share with us? I'll go ahead and start. Seems to be I'm the superintendent in the house today. <laughs> I'm Becky Robinson and I'm actually from South San Antonio and South San. And so we're barely actually partnering with the United, United Way for next year. So we're hoping to open up three parent centers but let me tell you what what uh, what we have done this year. I uh, I actually started in June the 25th this past fall. So I haven't even been on the job for a year. But one of the things coming into South San that we saw and, and, and seeing in the community in, in, in San Antonio is that there was a great need for educating our parents. And so, you know, the in order for our kids to be able to succeed, we've got to educate our parents. It's, it's a partnership. It's not about school, it's not about parents. It's about a partnership coming together. And in essence, hopefully we'll get a better product, you know, uh, coming and, and graduating and extending to college. But one of the things that we did, and we were trying not to do this until next year, but we felt that it was such an urgent need that we actually opened up our own parent and community center at South Sand. And so we uh, we actually opened it up February the 14th. We did the ribbon cutting, and uh, so basically right now we're offering free of service. We we do not charge our parents to go out there. Uh, we serve, we thought that our parents were going to go during the day to see us and, and, and accept our classes, but what we have found that the parents actually want to go at night. And so basically we're opening up all the way to eight o'clock at night. We have about about 75 parents right now that are going through ESL classes, um, no charge. Uh, we're doing GED classes at no charge. Uh, we're also um, finding out that a lot of our population didn't even have an email, or they had no access to email or computers. And so uh, through our technology department and through some of our staff, we've been able to offer uh, some of those services. And so we actually have parents that have come in and we've set up you know, their email accounts and uh, have started showing them how to do Microsoft Office real simple, <laughs> real basic things. Um, and so those are some things that, that, we're, that we're doing. Um, there was a big interest on Zumba, so we're running Zumba classes. <laughs> um, and so uh, we're basically kind of surveying our parents right now. What, is a, what are some of the things that you kind of want us to do? And, uh, we every single director that is uh, has a responsibility to to, uh, to conduct some kind of a workshop 
So we do literacy, uh, early literacy circles with our parents. We do um, how to teach science, kitchen science, uh, math at home. So we try to do some activities that are are fun and uh, the parents can do at home. And uh, let us worry about the complexities of the problem solving. Let us just work on the simple things that the parents can work on at home. Because homework is hard if any of you have ever tried doing some of that math homework. And so because you let us leave that to us. <laughs> but we certainly do want to teach you about what are some of the things and what does it look like. And you know, we kind of want to educate our, our parents to this is what to expect and this is what this are the things that your kids are going through. Uh, and so we've been uh, we've been doing February, March, April, May, right now. We're opening June. Uh, we decided to close July and open up in August just to give us a little breather. But we have a big, um, one of the things that I told the staff that we really wanted to see was to have a huge uh, parent uh, conference at our district. And we're gonna, we actually chose already the, uh, the first Saturday in December, we're actually opening up and we're gonna have, uh, try to invite everybody that has anything to do with family services, <coughs> community, and, and have them uh, provide you know information to the parents. And then, and then we're gonna provide all of these workshops that they can actually go to and, and get around to. And then of course, you know, we want to provide just a simple a simple breakfast, you know, because the blankets are great and uh, and then do a small little lunch and do a celebration of, you know, how many parents and of course it all has to be competitive because of the competitiveness that we have. And so we kinda wanna uh, award the schools that have the most parents, you know, present. And so we really wanted to make it a family affair. And uh, I, I think that working together in partnerships, those, those, you know, that is so important to us because it's not about family and school. It's about people working together for the betterment of the kids. That's our vision in South <laughs> I, I just I feel so strongly about the parental involvement. I think we see it on a daily basis. Our schools that have the heavier parental involvement are the more successful schools. And like Bobby said, uh, and our, our districts are, are quite large, and, but they are a microcosm of Texas. We're wealthy, we're poor, we're large, and we're small. And it doesn't matter what the school is, the more we see the parents in our schools, the more they're a part of our team, the better outcome for all of us, for, for our children, for our teachers, for our administration. They need all the help that they can get in today's economy too. So we love having them as part of our team. Um, we can come back to some of the other uh, school board and uh, school staff. Uh, I wanted to turn to one of our five-year-olds here. Uh, <laughs> 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 Here. <laughs> uh, Paul, can, can you talk about sort of your engagement with families, uh, a little bit about the city of model for, for those folks that may not be familiar? Sure. Um, <coughs> privileged to be here also. And if you look in the upper right hand corner of the Together for Tomorrow banner, that's the uh, Corporation for National and Community Service, and that's the parent organization of City Year. So it's an AmeriCorps organization like the School Turnaround AmeriCorps, Teach for America, some other organizations focused um, on the fact that there are tens of thousands of people that want to be full-time volunteers working in our schools to help with things like attendance, uh, increased attendance, um, better behavior, and, and succeeding in our, our courses and college readiness, but also interacting with our, with our parents and our community. So what we do is our, um, remember these are full-time volunteers, so they're gonna show up at the schools before the first child arrives, and they're gonna begin engaging with the parents as they drop off kids, um, uh, whoever shows up, right? Parent being all of those people that are advocates for and, and caring for the children that are coming to our schools. So they're gonna have interaction with them immediately as they're coming to school, and then they're gonna find out who didn't show up at school, and they're gonna make phone calls, maybe send a letter, um, and that letter is not only going to be, hey, we missed you, but the letter might be, um, way to go, you've been coming to school quite a bit. So it's a positive appreciation type of letter. Um, we're going to help support whatever organizations are going to actually go home to home. 
So we might be the very person that helps some of the parents do the home visits because um, they have a lot of energy, these full-time volunteers. And then we're gonna help uh, throughout the day um, with the teachers, but we might be uh, an interpreter <coughs> to the parents or kind of that another bridge with the parents. Um, we're gonna have interaction with them because we're not intimidating. Our sole purpose is to have this full-time volunteers that are about college age help interpret, help support, help advocate for, um, do all the things that can really be beneficial to the, to the family and to the child. After school again, we're still gonna be there, so now parents are coming back to pick up their child, or um, we're writing letters home because um, we wanna support, advocate for, appreciate. And then on the Saturdays, we're gonna make sure that we have like events where um, there's occasions for parents to come out and be part of the community. So. Um, and a good example of that might be a block party, it might be building green spaces uh, around our school community, it might be um, making sure that kids that have not had playgrounds uh, have a playground, and we're going to make sure that parents come out to that. So um, our, main, our main purpose really is to be the human capital um, with our schools and our community. And I guess our exit strategy would be that when there are parents and community that are so engaged in the schools, they don't really need a full-time volunteer at that school anymore because we might have a team of 10 or 15 that are really dedicated to that school, but now there's such great parent and community engagement that they are part of the fabric of that school and we can maybe move elsewhere um, where they don't have quite that kind of capacity. Yeah. So here we have a community partner that sees family engagement as key to its uh, exit strategy, sustainability, right? You know, right. We all bat around this term sustainability when we write grant applications or we start programs, but you know, here you know, we can look at that as a, a way to, it's, you know, to really make it real for the long term of the school. <laughs> another community partner we have here, uh, another one of our five-year-olds represented uh, <laughs> communities and schools, Rufus. Hi, good evening, Rufus. Uh, Sam King from Communities and Schools, I'm the executive director. Uh, the communities and schools model is essentially that we place a full-time committed individual into a school and the job of that person is to act as a super connector. You know, uh, just to give you an idea of, of what we do, we, we target and we assist students that are identified in conjunction with the school as being the most at risk of underperforming or not reaching their fullest potential. Last year, we were in 72 different schools around, in and around Bayer County. We served 7,631 students. Again, most at-risk students. And of those kids, 98% stayed in school. But what's important for me to mention here is all we did was connect those students and their families to the other people in the group. That's our job. That's what we do. We work with the school. We work with the other agencies in this room and we try and connect together the best resources that tailor-made tailor that fit those, those students. Um, I could plug CIS forever, but I want to do something else. Hi, I'm Rufus. I'm a, an educator uh, for the last 15 years and I'm a parent for the last 10. Uh, and I want to plant a seed that's a little bit provocative. Um, and that is to let you know that, you know, we talk about the dropout crisis. Um, Brenda, you said something earlier that really inspired me. You talked about fear. Uh, these two big words in education are fear and trust. Uh, and those are the two words that we need to own. Uh, as an educator, as educators in the room, you teach children to learn from their mistakes. That's one of the most effective ways to teach. But we're talking about the dropout crisis, but one thing we're not doing is this. My name is Rufus, I am a parent dropout. What I mean by that is I have three children, I've been a parent for 10 years, and through circumstance, not choice, I fail my children. I'm a divorcee, I don't get to be with my children 100% of the time, so they're missing something very important to them. To go to the, the comment that was made earlier about basic needs. You know, sometimes I have my kids at home, I want to see my mom. I can't do anything about that. How can I get them to focus on doing their homework. So I go to school meetings, they all go to SISD schools, and I'm not your typical SISD parent. You know, I'm this white guy with an English accent, and people somehow imbue me with a sense of intelligence that I don't have. Um, but, the, but the point is, I'm just 
another parent there. And it's my responsibility to say, I'm just another parent. Let's work together. You know, I'm also a guy. And looking around the room, there's another issue that we have. We're less than one fourth of the members of this room are men. Um, and yet about half, I'm pretty sure it's about half, of the kids in school that are struggling are probably boys, right? So, um, you know, I just, I, I want to encourage everyone to keep this conversation going, going now, and to really take ownership for our own involvement in, in the dropout crisis, because we, that, we own it, and we need to learn from it. Okay. So, that's me, I'll shut up, I'll sit down. Thank you. Um, Rufus, next to you we have uh, Sam. Sam, are you a dad too? Not yet. Hopefully soon. My wife's a teacher. She can. <laughs> Public schools. Uh, we're fortunate to have them represented. Uh, I think we have a couple of your colleagues as well. Uh, you know, there, there are not a lot of uh, opportunities the federal uh, U.S. Department of Education has to, to uh, you know, drive change on a local level. Uh, and one of the things that we've done, you know, obviously is uh, is look at how we could take you know, what are relatively small pots of discretionary funding and use them to get the best ideas from communities uh, to, to try to raise the bar about what's possible. We've done that through our Investing in Innovation Program. We've done that through our Race to the Top initiative. Uh, our last round of Race to the Top was Race to the Top District, uh, which was different than our, our previous ones. It was focused on, on, uh, on local opportunities uh, by local school districts or consortium districts. Uh, Idea Public Schools uh, won one of those Race to the Top District grants, uh, which had a priority on, on personalized learning and community and family partnerships. So can you just talk a little bit about what your approach is and then maybe what some of the things that you are struggling with as a school? Great, thanks. So I'm Sam Gessling with Idea. This is Rolando Posada. Rolando's our executive director here in San Antonio. I leave our, lead our development and external work. And um, we come here very humbly. We um, at IDEA, we have 13,000 students. We have 28 schools, most of which are in the Rio Grande Valley, where we started about 12 years ago with one school. Um, and since then, we've grown to the 28. And um, we've, we've uh, focused on having our low-income students go to and through college. And uh, Rolando and I are both former IDEA teachers and former principals. And we've seen a lot of the success that our students have had, but we've also seen um, that we've struggled to kind of help our students outside of the classroom. And when we wrote our Race to the Top grant, um, and we're very appreciative to the Department of Education um, for the opportunity, we wrote the grant with the idea of trying to find ways to help our students um, when they come to school um, be really ready for the school day. Because we put a lot of pressure on our teachers and our school leaders to um, you know, we have a no excuses mindset, we have the core value of whatever it takes to really help our students um, achieve during the day, but we realize that we, we can't do that within just the school walls. We need the help of parents, we need the help of community leaders, we need the help of people in the community um, with our students. So um, we come here tonight, we're really, I've already, I feel like I've taken a lot of notes already. We're already, I'm already learning quite a bit about things that we can do um, to really partner with parents. One of the things that we're doing um, is working with Rufus's organization, Communities and Schools, through our grant. We have a partnership at the high school that I led. Uh, we actually wrote into the grant, we wanted to bring communities and schools into our schools, both, both for uh, proactive reasons and reactive reasons. We have students who struggle with drug use, um, students who struggle with pregnancy, and we wanted to help those students in our schools, and the Communities and Schools team has been incredibly helpful in kind of finding resources in the community to help them out. And then also helping the kids to be proactive to think about those things. So we're going to be expanding that program across our region, across our schools. Um, we're also looking to partner um, with communities and find out what's out there within the Rio Grande Valley, within the San Antonio, within the Austin community where we are, um, to find out what organizations are there that we can partner with. So the first part of our work with the Race to the Top grant is figuring out, um, having a survey of our parents, our students, our teachers, and really finding out what some of the needs are, but also what some of the qualities 
um, and attributes and just successful organizations that are out there that can help us out. Um, I'm really excited to kind of dive into this work. It's something that is really, in some ways, new to us at IBEA. I think that we've done it in sporadic instances. For example, as a principal, um, I used to work with Proyecto Azteca in terms of some of the housing needs for our students and in some of the um, local doctors in the area to help our students out with dental needs. But it was kind of a sporadic approach and we're hoping to do it as a much more um, broader vision across all of our schools. Um, do you want to add anything for San Antonio? Or? I think the only thing is uh, the mission of college for all children. I thought that was a very good summary. But um, I love that we're talking about families and schools and faith. So I guess you don't mind me using a proverb. <laughs> there's a proverb that says, um, there's a way, a path that seems right to man, but it leads him to destruction. And I think a lot of our young people end up feeling like they're on the right path. But in reality, they're going far away from education. They're going far away from good decisions. They're going far away from prosperity and from success. So at IDEA, we really invest a lot of time on the front end, creating a powerful learning culture, powerful learning environment. We write goals around things like attendance. 98% is a bar for us. Persistence, we want every child to persist with us from August to August, on track to graduate, and exemplary, a few other uh, goals that we set. And so we figure that if we put these milestones down and then monitor the progress towards those milestones throughout the year, eventually we can get and push every single child to college. We have uh, pushed or sent six graduating classes of seniors with 100% college matriculation to college. Uh, our seventh class has just, uh, we've gotten the last acceptance and now the hard work this summer begins in converting that college acceptance to a college matriculation. It starts with a simple belief for us that uh, every child has value, every child can learn, and every child is actually college material. But uh, we feel very blessed to be here today to just kind of um, take as much in from you guys. We've taken a lot of notes, like Sam says, and we're trying to learn as much as we can about the parental engagement piece. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to, to shift a little bit and um, have about five minutes of discussion um, in, in, um, in pairs or in triads. So if you could turn to, to someone next to you. What, what, what are one or two things that you've heard today that uh, really strike you as great ideas that we need to see more of? And then, and then, second, then the second question is, is uh, what, what wasn't present today? What are the things that aren't happening that you think we also need to be doing uh, around uh, family and school collaboration? So what's the two things again? One is what's, what's great that you've heard here? And the second is, what are we missing? What, what else needs to happen? Uh, well, it is uh, 8.14. Uh, we will go until 8.20 with this, and then come back up with some uh, short discussion and Q&A. Happy Thank you. 
Someone mentioned about starting in the morning. Uh, we're there for breakfast duty to help the school. We're there at lunchtime for lunchtime duty, of, and plus everything else we need to do. We we built a relationship, which is something very special with the school. We built a relationship with the parents, which is the most important, so they can come. Then the principal, we sit at the table once a month. We all discuss what are we going to do, how's it going to happen, who's going to contribute, and we partner up all, all around the school, PBIS, Al, um, CLT. So for, so, the par so for the parents that you're working with, what, you know, what of uh, these things stand out for you as the most important? <laughs> the trust. And the hardest thing is getting them in, because we could be 15 reps that are there every day and how do we pull in more you know we try we try and you know that's the hardest thing that we're finding because a lot of them work a lot of them maybe uh i don't know what the barrier is but they find it hard to come to the group hi uh, my name is alberta harrison i am a volunteer rep at sam houston high school uh, what I'm a like, Sam Houston parent. Yes, and I'm a Sam Houston parent, uh, two lovely daughters. Um, I like to tell Rufus and Paul, I give y'all my kudos, because what community and school and city year and connecting with the parent role, they balance each other out. They have each other's back. So when we sit down every Tuesday to have a meeting, we come together as one, we uh, help each other with events so no one can be left out. So by having each other back as uh, three, three amigos coming together, <laughs> we, we work great and that balance of helping each other goes a long way. Thank you. You guys are awesome. <laughs> So parents or others, what do we what do we need to see more of? What's I mean, what has stood out to you? Yeah, back there. Well, my brother, no brother, Good afternoon. My name is Elga Hernandez. 
Uh, soy padre de coach de Perching Elementary. I am a parent coach at Perching Elementary. Empecé como voluntaria y para mí ha sido uh, muy bueno atraer más padres. I started as a volunteer and for me it's been great to be being able to involve more parents. Tenemos ahora uh, como nueve padres representantes que empezaron de voluntario. Right now we have about nine parent reps that started just volunteering. Y lo que nos ha resultado es que tenemos muy buena comunicación con la principal. The best key for us has been that we have great communication with the principal. Uh, ella nos acepta los eventos, compartimos eventos. Uh, ellos nos comunican para cómo poder nosotros ayudar a los maestros. We share events. Uh, we have access and share different events and they tell us on ways how to communicate with the parents. Y también nosotros compartimos uh, con community in the school, uh, Promise Neighborhood, cada padre de nosotros representantes <coughs> tiene un puesto en nuestro cuarto. Uh, and we participate in community in the school and each of us parent right, have a, an assignment or a position <coughs> in the parent room. Sí, y, eh, a cada uno le toca ir como a Promise Neighborhood Ellos nos comunican los eventos que hay y nosotros uh, lo compartimos con la comunidad en la escuela. For, for example, each one uh, does something and someone may go to the uh, Promise Neighborhood uh, program and then they share with us the events that might be coming up and then we, in turn, share it with the community. Hay, hay muchos voluntarios que han ido a participar a los demás, a los demás uh, eventos que han habido <coughs> Conforme la comunidad. There are many other volunteers that have gone and participated in other events in the community too. Uh, también estamos a uh, uh, gracias también a la principal porque nos ha apoyado con el reading club. We also thanks to the principal, she has given us a lot of support in the reading club. Estamos uh, trabajando con los maestros a veces uh, para los homework que les dan. We also work with the teachers about the homeworks that they give the students. Y nosotros les ayudamos a repasarlo ya cuando ven a ellos los niños al día siguiente. Ellos ya están más avanzados. And we help review so that the next day when the child comes, they they uh, feel that they're more advanced mm -hmm. in homework. Eso nos ha resultado mucho. Y tengo mucho más para compartir, pero <laughs> those are positive things that have really worked for us, and I have a lot more things. <laughs> for seven years. Uh, otra cosa que hemos tenido positivo en estos últimos meses desde que empezó el año es enfocarnos en outreach. Uh, and one of the positive things that we have been uh, working on these last few months is to focus in the outreach. También uh, home visits. And home visits. Y la meta que nos propusimos escuela por escuela son 10 escuelas es juntar una meta de 10 padres por escuela, pero a uh, darle seguimiento. The objective that we have had each of the schools, 10 schools, our goal is to be able to gather 10 parents per school. Para que esto crezca más y unir más padres que se involucren en la escuela con sus hijos. So this would be growing as a network and be able to have more parents that would be involved with their own children. Y si nos ha dado un buen resultado, ahorita todas las escuelas que estamos aquí somos 10 uh, y cada escuela se ha reclutado más de 10 padres uh, que se están reclutando nuevos a las escuelas. Mm -hmm. And we have had great results. Right now we are represented, uh, 10 schools have been represented here and each of the schools have been able to recruit <coughs> more than 10 parents each. Y ahorita estamos por finalizar, bueno, para empezar las summer home visits de verano y pues uh, tenemos diferentes grados que nos estamos enfocando en la escuela y cada escuela está haciendo 
arriba de 150 visitas para este summer. Mm -hmm. We are about to start the summer mm -hmm. home visits and uh, we have focus in different grade levels, but our goal is that each of the school is going to have over 150 home visits this summer. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You wanted to hear from the corporate sector, so I can't let the evening in without that. <laughs> I'm Peggy Walker, and I, I happen to work for Bank of America, but we're just one of many companies in this community that support work education and, and, and things beyond education. But I've been involved with this United Way partnership for its full seven years. But I've been a United Way volunteer here for 25. And I think what's different about San Antonio is that not only does the corporate community come together, but all of these organizations and agencies together in collaboration in trying to fill the gaps because it's not just one grade level, it's from birth on. And so here in this community, it's, it's very hard for people to afford childcare. And quality early childhood education is a challenge that we've been dealing with ever since I've been here, ever since I've been involved. And United Way is involved in that all the way to cafe college and, and higher education and the focus on dropout rates. And so the corporate sector and all of these partners are working together at every age level to deal with this. But I will say that the investment in this United Way School Family Partnership is extraordinary. It's not one that we could spend dollars on and just give to a, to a school or to an agency, even though we support many of these agencies. It's about these parents and the work that they do in the agencies and they know what's happening. And for us to make decisions without their involvement and their, their education of us, which is humbling, it really is, is just fantastic. And so I think collaboration and partnership and listening to the people who are really near to the situation is what we all really need to focus on. And so thank you for being here. One resource that hasn't been mentioned is the faith communities of the neighborhood. And um, we are about to do our third year of a summer school, hosting a summer school enrichment program for the local public elementary school on our church campus. Because the principal came to us and wanted to do an enrichment program for kids that had been targeted as at risk of failing. But they couldn't fund it uh, through the school system. So we hosted on our campus uh, the first two years, the school district paid the teachers. Uh, we provided tutors. Uh, the food bank provided meals. Um, this year, this, some of the funding was not available through the uh, NEISD, so we raised the money to help pay the teachers. But uh, I think the, the important thing is that we're providing neighborhood grandparents. That So each class has eight kids. The teachers love it. They get eight kids in the class. They have no tests they have to do. They don't have to fill out any forms. All they do is teach. And they get two tutors per class. Uh, so they have uh, teach a lesson, they get two tutors to work with the kids. And then the tutors continue to tutor throughout the school year with the same kids. Uh, so there's a tremendous uh, resource of, of retired teachers, retired people in the community who want to work with these kids. Uh, and they're blessed more than the kids are because they feel like they're doing something important. But I think there's a, a huge resource and there are lots of churches that have facilities that sit empty most of the time that could be used for learning opportunities. And what, what's your congregation again? Where is this being hosted? It's Episcopal Church of Reconciliation. Uh, we're on the northeast side and we work with Cerna Elementary, which is uh, a public elementary school in the Northeast Independent School District. A wonderful, wonderful example. I, I was with Secretary Duncan uh, when he spoke to a faith-based organization one night at a band place. And there were about 1,200 pastors in this room. And he said in the midst of his remarks, churches are the most underutilized real estate in America. And you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm staffing it, right? I feel the air, like, like, oh, I'm out of the room. And he went ahead to say, 
you know, how can we how can we work with you to make sure that this this precious real estate is used for our, our community in deeper ways than it seems to be being used now. Well, by the time he finished, he got a standing ovation and, you know, <laughs> and probably get him out of the room. But sometimes we just have to remind people that what they have to offer is needed and is valued and that we can work together and use it all. And, and usually when I, we make these, um, we have these conversations, I do remember to say, that there is no conflict with separation of church and state because this is active in your faith. This is civic engagement. This is being involved as good members in the community meeting unmet needs. So we thank you all for being here tonight to, to share with us, to, to help us learn, and to show that there are partners all across the nation that understand this work and are willing to deepen the work that's being done, that you're willing to lay the groundwork you're willing to get the work done and then celebrate what you've done and, and to celebrate together. And I invite you to just carry away in your spirits this evening the, uh, the sentiment of this, of this saying that I am only one, but I am one. Mm -hmm. I could not do everything for family and community engagement, but I can do something. <laughs> and what I can do, I will do. And if each of us lives up to that, whew, we cannot be stopped. And we will all be blessed with so many children. Thank you so much. And there's still lots of food. I know. Thank <laughs> you.